The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. Well, hello, this is Grace in Focus. We thank you so much for joining us today. Grace in Focus is a ministry about eternal salvation and how you can acquire it. Currently, we are taking your questions and giving you answers. And today in Matthew 16, to what does the rock, the keys, and the binding and the loosing refer? Dr. Bob Wilkin and David Renfro are providing our answers, and here they are now. I'm here again with my friend David Renfro, and uh, David, we've got a question from somebody named Blake, I believe. Yes, it's a very interesting one uh, on a very interesting passage. Here's what he says. Um, He says, in Matthew 16, verses 17 through 19, what do the rock, the keys, and the binding slash loosing mean? More simply, what do you believe Jesus is referring to when he makes the final statement about binding and loosing on earth and heaven? Why don't we read Matthew uh, 16, verses 17 through 19? 17 through 19, yeah. All right, if you could read that, and then we can talk about what is going on. He has questions about, well, three things, so we'll look at those. Here's what Matthew 16, verses 17 through 19 say. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay. First of all, he wanted to know, Blake did, about the rock, right? Yeah. The ro- what do the rock, the keys, and the binding and loosing mean? Okay. So the rock refers to, some people say, of course, Roman Catholics say that the church is built on the popes and that Peter was the first pope, right? right? And so the church is built on him and all of the popes that followed him, which they call apostolic succession. However, that's not a teaching in Scripture, and besides, the church is not built on Peter. In Ephesians 2.20, we're told that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And so all of the apostles are part of the foundation of the church, and the prophets are part of the foundation, meaning the first generation of the church. And, of course, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone of the foundation. Right. So he's the key to the whole thing that holds the church together. But the rock here is what Peter had just confessed. Before what you read, Peter had said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That confession is the foundation upon which the church is built. That is the rock. Right. That's the rock. Peter's name reminds us of his confession. His name, Petros, means Means, rock. Yeah, he's doing a kind of a play on words there, isn't he? Yeah, the Lord gave him a name which meant both that his confession was the rock, but also that Peter was to be a key player in the early church. And he was. Of course, Peter, James, and John were the three disciples closest to the Lord. Mm -hmm. They were the ones with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, only those three. And on many occasions, even in Gethsemane, Mm -hmm. he took Peter, James, and John aside and said, pray here with me. So the rock basically is Peter's confession. Concerning the keys of the kingdom, there's two ways to take this. Many commentators think that what's going on is this is keys to getting into the kingdom. And so they'll say that Peter's great confession, you are the Christ, Son of God, that's the way in which people get into the kingdom, Mm -hmm. like John 20, 31. So, for example, Leon Morris has a quote like that. We should understand it here in close connection with Peter's confession of faith. It was on the basis of his confession and not on that of personal abilities that Peter was given the keys. And he seems to be talking about keys to entering the kingdom. However, R.T. France takes a different view, and I'm inclined toward his view. He cites Isaiah 22, verses 20 to 22, which is a passage about someone uh, called Eliakim, right? Yeah, my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, that's verse 20. And he has keys and he's able to admit or... Yeah, verse 21 of that passage kind of implies that he will be given authority 
I will clothe him with your robe, strengthen him with your belt, and so on. Commit the responsibility to his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, which I think is kind of interesting. And right after that, he says, the key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So what France points out is he was given authority to give provisions for the household. And here's what France says. The keys are those of the storehouses to enable him to make appropriate provision for the household, not those of the outer gate to control admission. The traditional portrayal of Peter as porter at the pearly gates depends on misunderstanding, quote, the kingdom of heaven, unquote, here as a designation of the afterlife rather than denoting God's rule among his people on earth, unquote. So what France is saying is that the keys of the kingdom are that Peter is to give provisions to the people of God and all of the apostles, of course, and all spiritual leaders, all pastors, Bible study teachers, etc. Mm-hmm. They're to feed the flock, right? That's their job. And so that would be the keys of the kingdom. It's like the keys to the storehouse. And, you know, there's always these jokes about Peter at the pearly gates. Right. And I didn't know this, but I guess people may get it from this passage. But in terms of the binding and loosing, there's two different ways to take this. And I took the liberty of pulling a couple of commentaries, and one of them is Lou Barbieri in the Bible Knowledge Commentary. And the way Lou Barbieri takes this binding and loosing, he thinks it refers more or less to evangelism. He says, this privilege of binding and loosing was seen in Peter's life as he has the privilege on the day of Pentecost to proclaim the gospel and announce to all those who responded in saving faith that their sins were forgiven. And he was also able to do the same thing with the household of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. So he sees this as sort of an evangelistic idea. Hmm. However, quite a few commentators point out that Notice what he talks about the binding and loosing. Whatever. It doesn't say whoever. Right. It says whatever. It's neutral in the Greek. I found a quote from Leon Morris in his commentary, and he says, The metaphor of binding and loosing was used by the rabbis for declaring forbidden or permitted. There is a strong opinion that the Christians thought rather of excluding from and admitting to the Christian community. This may be correct, though we should bear in mind that the word whatever is neutral both times. Neuter. Neuter both times. Thank you. And that it fits better with things than with people. If we take this seriously, the saying means that the Spirit-inspired church will be able to declare authoritatively what things are forbidden and what things are permitted. So basically what the Lord is saying is in this new group called the ecclesia, the church, Church. Jews and Gentiles together in one body, they're going to be the ones who determine what's permitted and what's not. I wonder if that has to do with kind of what we mentioned in another show about, okay, what do we bring into this new thing called the ecclesia, the church? And what I'm talking about is maybe ritual. You've got Jews that had rituals coming out their ears, you know, from the Old Testament law. So I'm wondering if that which is permissible and not permissible is a declaration of what kind of ritual would be accepted in this new thing called the church. I think that's right. You know, Peter didn't always come out on the right side of this binding and loosing. Mm -mm. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul talks about the fact that when they were in Antioch, Barnabas and Peter withdrew from the Gentiles, evidently at the Lord's Supper meeting. In other words, before certain Jews came from Jerusalem, Peter and Barnabas were eating. They were sitting with the Gentiles. They were experiencing the Lord's Supper together. Mm -hmm. There was no division. Then some Jews came from Jerusalem, and suddenly Peter and Barnabas separated from the Gentiles, and either they got their own table or they were having their own Lord's Supper meeting or whatever, but there was a division. Paul said they weren't being straightforward about the truth of the gospel Mm -hmm. because the truth of the gospel is Jews and Gentiles are united in one body. Exactly. But I also think of the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 Mm -hmm. because ostensibly the issue there was what do Gentiles need to believe to be born again? 
Mm -hmm. Very, very quickly, they all agreed that they, all they have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. for their salvation, for everlasting life. But what they then went on to talk about is the questionable things. Mm -hmm. And you remember the end of Acts 15, they had certain prohibitions, verse 29? That you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Frankly, I think all of those are tied to pagan practices. And they're also all highly offensive to Jewish people. Exactly. And so to make sure that their mission to Jewish unbelievers was not hindered, they wanted the Gentiles to keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood oh, and things strangled and then from sexual immorality. I'm not sure that's probably sexual immorality that's related to the Jewish law. Since it's in the book of Acts and we're dealing with Gentile and Jewish believers, I can't help but think that maybe some of these things are tied to pagan worship that the Gentile believers are bringing in. Yeah. My studies of the New Testament, it's amazing how strong the pagan world was in the Roman Empire. So in kind of wrapping this up because we're out of time, David, but binding and loosing was a prerogative of the apostles, but it still applies to us today because we have the writings of the apostles. Exactly. We bind and loose today based on the writings of Christ and the writings of the apostles. Right. I, I shouldn't say writings of Christ because he spoke and then it was written down by the gospel writers. I, I, yeah, there, there's more and more stuff is being thrown at the church and they want the church to accept it. Um <laughs> My principle is, what does the Bible say? That's exactly and, right. And that's our final authority on this. And what is compatible with the Bible and is acceptable and uh, what's not, you throw away. Amen. Well, thanks for listening and keep grace in focus. Thank you both for that informative discussion. Our goal at the Grace Evangelical Society is to teach Scripture clearly and without confusion. One of the best tools for that clarity, we believe, is our website. It's faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. On our site, we have all kinds of materials that are designed to help you mature and grow in your faith and your understanding of Scripture. Please come visit us at faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. You'll be glad you did. God loves a cheerful giver, and that's why we think our financial partners are some of the happiest people in the world. If you would like to learn how to become a financial partner with Grace and Focus, we would very much appreciate it. Learn more at faithalone.org. It's really exciting to hear from our listeners. So if you've got a question, comment, or feedback, I hope you'll reach out to us. Best way to do that is through email. Here is our email address. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. On the next Grace in Focus, maybe you've wondered about this. Was Cain a believer or an unbeliever? We will discuss it on the next edition. Please join us. This is the Grace Evangelical Society. Until next time, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.